This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisy. I'm Bridget Fetisy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week's sponsor is Fetacy Inc. Fetacy Inc. just wants to make you laugh while the world burns. So buy our mugs and t-shirts. <laughs> and this week, they're offering 15% off all merch at BridgetFetacy.com with user code WALKIN. <laughs> This week, we welcome Zuby. Zuby is a musician, author, podcaster, public speaker, fitness expert, and life coach. Zuby doesn't shy away from expressing himself, and he has a refreshing and compelling level of honesty. If you're interested in seeing him, he's been all over in 2019, The Rogan Show, Adam Carolla, Glenn Beck, Ruben Report, Ben Shapiro, Everywhere you turn, you might have seen Zuby. And I got to sit down with him when he was coming through LA on his American tour. Very inspiring and motivating. I hope you guys enjoy. We have Zuby, everyone. Are we going already or no? We're we, going. We're going. Zuby in the house. Okay, we're going already? Let's do Just it. Just like that? Okay. Yeah, we'll edit all the weirdness out. Okay. We have Zuby in the house. Welcome. Happy to be here. You've been on quite the tour. Tell us, so tell, tell my listeners who the fuck you are. This is a question I always get though, so I understand it. But I, I told people you we were coming, they're like, who is that guy? I see him, but who is he? I'm like, this must mm, be how people feel about me. Like, what does that girl do? Okay, well, I'm a full-time independent rapper. Okay. I'm a professional musician. I am also a podcaster. I'm the host of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. I'm also an author. Wrote my first book, which is a fitness book called Strong Advice, which came out a couple of months ago, which I've been doing some promotion for. And um, I guess all around creative entrepreneur. But Just a go getter. Yeah. But a musician would be my prime thing that certainly initially these days, I don't know. But right. prior to the madness of this year, that's what most people knew me for. And what where are you from? I am from the UK. I was okay. born in England. I was raised in Saudi Arabia. Oh, okay. I went to an American school in Saudi Arabia for about eight years, hence the hybrid accent. And my family background is originally from Nigeria. Oh, and yeah, you don't have the accent or no. very mild. No, it confuses people. Whether I'm in the UK or in the US, people can't really tell where I'm from. Everyone in England thinks I'm American. Interesting. And I think a lot of Americans think I'm also American. So, so. were you mil like a military or a um, ambas uh, like an embassy kid? No, neither one. My dad's a doctor. Okay. Um, but he was a doctor for um, a big oil company. Ah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. So uh, I've had an interesting background, exposure to a lot of different cultures, and yeah, traveled a lot beyond that, and everything I've done with my music and outside of that. So, yeah, I like to think I have a pretty decent perspective on the world what did you think about saudi arabia i loved it yeah yeah it's a great place to grow up interesting where whereabouts were you i was um first i lived in a place called abkake and then a place called Udalia. both of them are very, very small the closest places that people may know of would be dahran or mm -hmm. al kobar mm -hmm. those are the larger cities that i was not too far from and where and when did you move how old were you when you left um, I was one when we moved there. Okay. And I was so like 10. 20 oh. when we left. Oh, okay. But, um, I went to boarding school when I was 11. Oh. So I've been in the UK on and off since the age of 11, since all my middle school years, high school, university. But I was back and forth between the two countries. So during vacation, I'd still be, I'd normally go back to Saudi. But during the term time, I'd be in the UK. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And so then did you go to college? I did, yeah. I'm an Oxford graduate. Okay, nice. Yeah, I studied computer science at Oxford. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I what, don't do, you, do much with that. Yeah, or do you yeah. use it? No, not really. Not directly anyway. Um, it's great to have on my CV or even my, my hip-hop bio that I'm an Oxford University graduate because it's a pretty rare achievement. Yeah, it's um, good school. And I, I learned a lot from it, gained a lot of good friends there, and... It was definitely something worth doing. I didn't particularly love my degree. Mm -hmm. um, in hindsight, I probably would have done a different subject, but I love Oxford. I love the city. I love the university. What would you have done? 
maybe biology, something like that, just because it was the subject that probably interested me most when I was in school. Did you get a computer science degree because you felt pressured to? Or? No, not at all. Yeah. No, 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 no. It wasn't pressure. I'm very interested in technology and computers. Uh-huh. I do like computers and IT and stuff, but um, I'm not super duper into coding and software engineering and mm-hmm. some of the stuff that the some of the mathematics and whatnot that the course actually entailed in mm-hmm. reality, but I wasn't totally aware of exactly what it would be going into it. So it was it was it wasn't until I was there that I was kind of like, mm, this isn't really what I love. But right. I thought, you know, let me stick it out. Maybe it'll get better. But yeah, you know, I, I did. I didn't absolutely hate it, but I didn't love it. Yeah. I liked the rest of the university experience, but the tutorials and lectures and stuff were a little bit boring but on the plus side you know it really pushed me very very hard oh um, i bet i'm someone who just kind of i sailed through school to be honest with you like, yeah i found stuff pretty easy yeah I, I got like top marks and everything and then when i got to oxford i was suddenly surrounded by all these border, geniuses. borderline geniuses yeah. and actual geniuses and that kind of kicked my butt and yeah hum- and humbled me and made me be like okay wow okay you're uh <laughs> yeah yeah so that's I mean, a fun experience yeah that's been my experience even of the past year is just realizing how little I know. And I was hanging out with like the grievance studies people. Oh, yeah, yeah. And my God, they're just genius. You know, <laughs> Helen Pluck Rose is a genius and they have so much knowledge and, and just interesting perspectives and brains. And I'm like, I don't know anything. Yeah. I, I was struggling to keep. I love that feeling of struggling to keep up. <laughs> Well, a lot of us, we, we all know far less than we know. Yeah. That's just the reality of the world. I think wisdom is kind of knowing the extent of your own ignorance. Yes. Well, I have a lot of, a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, I, it's interesting that biology, because of is your fitness book and you're kind of, this is part of all of what I see from you online is you have a deep passion for helping people get out of their own way, particularly physically. I have a lot of respect for, you know, mine is, I feel like a little bit more mental with people just coming from my own addictions, but um, physically as well. And I think it's so necessary. Mm -hmm. And having a background in biology, when I was teaching yoga, I'm like, I wish I had gone and gotten like a background in anatomy Mm. or biology, just because I think it adds to that your ability to kind of tap into helping people in that way. I always say if I go back, I would have wanted a degree in evolutionary biology. Okay. I'm fascinated with, because I, I'm always like, we're the, it comes up a lot with the gender stuff. And when I was writing for playboy, I was like, you guys can't outthink thousands of years of evolutionary biology because you took one gender studies class. Nope. One generation isn't going to like change these dynamics as much as no. you want to try. No, Shit's it's, just going to get weird. And it's getting weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's, getting, it's, it's gotten weird. I mean, it's going to get so weird. It, it's, I don't know. Sometimes I just think it's because there aren't enough real problems. We going don't on. have. Pe- yeah. People are too comfortable. I often joke that we need a war. And uh, I say that, I say that jokingly, but also kind of seriously. Jesse like, Kelly says that yeah, all the time. I don't, I don't want a war. I don't, <laughs> but I'm just like, you know how that all, so much of this nonsense would end so quickly. That's what I always say. If, like some real stuff hit the fan. Yeah. I, I've been saying this like for years on even Playboy. I'm like, you know, things, the gender roles sort themselves out pretty quick when mm-hmm. there's like any kind of natural disaster oh yeah they want the patriarchy call him call in the patriarchy real quick <laughs> real quick help us please anything from a flat tire house on fire getting robbed call the patriarchy i don't want some chick digging me out of the <laughs> rubble <laughs> like, i need a dude to dig me out from the earthquake there we, there rubble we go. yeah we have some uses us men you know <laughs> we're not all that bad I like that you put that, you, you know, I think it's important. Joe Rogan gets a lot of shit for this too, the Joe Rogan masculinity. And I would rather, if I had boys, I would rather have them have examples like, for instance, you and Joe Rogan and people who are, are I feel, using their masculinity in a way that's productive and helpful and not completely devoid of, you know, some of the issues that women face. Yeah. But still, giving a good solid exam role models of masculinity that aren't necessarily quote unquote toxic, which is I, whatever, not sure how I feel about that 
terminology. I yeah. think th- I think humans can be toxic. Absolutely. There's no need to link it to one particular. Like I know a gender. lot of toxic feminines. Oh yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Like um, you know, I mean, it's it's important. I did a talk on this in London a couple of weeks ago, um, at the Ayn Rand Center. Just yeah, talking about masculinity and the role of men in society and kind of what it's like to be a man in 2019, at least when I choose to identify as one. And uh, yeah, just some of the the demonization of it, the whole this whole notion of toxic masculinity and some of the struggles that boys and men are generally facing, which don't really get addressed. I, I, I'm starting to see that pendulum swing and people are starting to take it a little more seriously and realize, oh, we've kind of been overlooking, you know, in the pursuit of some of the feminist agendas or even the more you know decent female equality push it's sort of like men have been forgotten about for a couple of decades Mm -hmm. and it's only now people are kind of realizing oh hang on maybe like dudes have got some issues that Mm -hmm. they might want to that we might want to look at as well um we've been focusing so much on the girls and on the women which is which is fine but too much of that has come at the expense of men or feeling that okay to to raise women we need to tear down men which right. is not something i believe in i don't think i don't either yeah a lot of people have this idea that to raise one specific group you've got to tear down another group right um, people do this along all kinds of different lines whether they're gender sexuality race yeah all these things and i just think the whole thing is divisive nonsense yeah that's uh, really not what i stand for at all so i like to stand up as a as a vocal bulwark against any kind of nonsense that I see out there that I genuinely believe could be damaging to society because yep. the crazy people won't shut up. No, so they won't. That, that's why I became more vocal about a lot of stuff. I mean, I've, I've been on Twitter since 2009. Yeah. And I used to be very, very apolitical. Yeah. I wouldn't really put my thoughts out there. I would just kind of use it for my, my music and my projects and my work and connecting with people and stuff. And then stuff to go, just got to a stage where it's like, look, these crazy people are they're they're going off on one and they seem to be gaining too much sway and power and momentum. So we need more people who are just sane and rational. They don't need to be on any particular side of politics or whatever. Just decent people with different opinions, just voicing up and saying, okay, wait, hang on. Dra- trying to draw some boundaries and remind people of what's actually important mm-hmm. and empower people and let people know, oh no, you know, men are not out to get you. The the men aren't trying to no, men are men. Are, we're not meeting every every month at these patri- <laughs> patriarchy meetings and thinking how we can oppress women and make their lives worse. That's not really how things operate. Although, if you go by what certain people are saying, that's how they make it sound. You know, I, I imagine that you know white people aren't having meetings to discuss how they can no, oppress, we are. Oppre- well, just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't know. I, yeah, I, I know there are some of those meetings, but that's like a really specific set. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not like a general. Not, not not the usual. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not a general thing, right? But the way you hear all these narratives, that's how people make it sound, and I just think it's also the it's so the silly. conspiratorial nature of every the conspiracy thinking yeah. that's just taken over the globe is beyond. <laughs> it's just craziness it seems like it's an it's a disease you know like in fact that i was reading brene brown she writes a lot about shame and she in her book um rising strong she talks about conspiracy thinking and how it's our own need to essentially make sense and build story it's just Mm -hmm. the human brain so in lieu of having an objective reality that we can build our world around we will lean into conspiracy Mm -hmm. theories Mm -hmm. And you see that more and more, you know, this po- postmodern kind of deconstruction of objective reality has leading these it's leaving these huge gaps in the story and yeah. people are filling them with this crazy nonsense. Yeah, it is just it is just nonsense. I mean, sometimes I want to just totally ignore it All and of it. just be like, whatever, <laughs> but go that, live the, the in prob- a cave. Yeah, but the the reality is that it's gaining, like I said, it's gaining power, it's gaining mm-hmm. momentum, and it's starting to affect people in real world ways, whether you're talking about men beating women in their own sports, as I demonstrated in my deadlift video, whether you're talking about... Um, I get school. called a turf like every day. Yeah, it's, it's okay, don't worry. Um, I get called a turf and I'm not even a feminist. <laughs> um, and when people call me that, I'm like, first of all, I'm not a radical feminist. <laughs> um, For those listeners who don't know, turf is trans exclusionary radical feminist. Yeah, people just, it, I don't even know. 
I don't even know. And I guess with me as well, like with my background is, you know, my family background is from Nigeria. I grew up in Saudi Arabia and all of this nonsense just does not exist. Some of the, some of the ideas and concepts that people are discussing and debating in, in the US or in the UK, like, dude, if you go to Nigeria and you start talking to people about this, they're, they're going to look at you like you're just the complete the most like insane. you're from another planet. <laughs> like, wait, what are, you, what are you even talking about? Yeah. What, what do you mean that? What do you mean there's no difference between men and women? Yeah. Like, what, what, just, what do you? What, that, they're just looking at you like, what, 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 you know, get this person away. Like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> yeah. It's so crazy. It's just weird. I, I find myself in certain conversations, and I'm like, how is this? This is not real. Yeah. This, how's this a conversation? Why is this? Yeah. A debate? No. This, can it's we just, crazy. Yeah. I. That's the craziest shit to me. I think that's really where. <laughs> You know, when people are like, well, you become this reactionary against the left. And I'm like, the, <laughs> they lost me when they started. I mean, I there was a publication that I wrote for. And recently they put out this article and the disclaimer. It was about um, the uh, like women's abortion rights. But mm. then they had a disclaimer that said, you know, we realize that not only women can have abortion. And I like I was like, can we stop with this nonsense, please? <laughs> like. It's That's insane. That's the and shit that makes me feel like I'm living in a, I'm like, did I take fucking crazy pills? <laughs> like, how is this That was in the, de in the Democratic disclaimer. debates, right? Yeah. When they were all trying to outwoke each other in between speaking Spanish. And I was just like, this is utterly ridiculous. It's and, so and, and absurd. And Britain, too, when they were live tweeting your freaking thing yesterday, they were... It's too much. We have too much privilege. You know, well, we have seriously. too much. Yeah, seriously. People are too comfortable. We need, uh, we need some strife. We need like some some famine or some war. I got so mad. At <laughs> yeah, I, maybe the climate change does need to come kill us. Yeah. I was talking yes, somebody the um two nights ago during the climate change marathon telethon or okay. whatever the hell it was. It felt like a telethon on CNN. I was tweeting about how I'm a, t a climate change nihilist, and then yeah. everyone was like, "This is." dangerous I'm like you guys are fucking jerking <laughs> off ordering amazon just on here virtue signaling in my mentions telling me that my one tweet is the thing that's gonna fucking kill the last polar bear like what are you talking about it's crazy me it's, this tweet is not gonna be the thing that sends us into the next ice age everybody calm very, down people are very very fanatically religious about it oh yeah, yeah. i mean they're do it's a doomsday call yeah that it's, shit it's, it's amazing I, like i i'm a religious dude and some of the most religious people out there right now are like totally secular. Yeah. And they don't realize that they themselves are religious fanatics just yep. for secular religions. Yeah. Wokeism. Yeah. And it's it's amazing to me. I mean, they've just got certain sacred cows. Mm -hmm. and it's like if you say anything, not even like, for example, with the climate change stuff. Right. It's like I don't I've never even come across anybody who denies climate change right you hear this term climate change denier so it's yeah. a climate change i've never come across anybody who does not accept that climate change is something that happens right some people think the majority is is man-made yeah some people think the majority is just natural environmental just how stuff works in in space i don't know all the details of it <laughs> yeah but you know, we we know in the history of the world, you've gone through ice ages. Yeah. And all hot, hot. So, yeah, the, the climate changes like we all know that. But it's so weird. It's like any criticism of anything to do that or even just asking a question. Mm. People just come down so crazy hot. And it's like, what do you what's up with you? Like, where where did this come from? When did this become the new religion? And you've got people saying, oh, the world's going to end and we've got six years to reverse it These or this is going to end. The I feel so bad for the kids. Yeah. And you've got people saying people shouldn't even have kids because of climate change. You're yeah. Having young millennials. I'm ashamed to be a millennial sometimes. You've got these millennials, you know, making these pacts. We're not going to we're not going to have children because of climate change. I mean, I often joke on Twitter that um, well, it's not really a joke. I say that if I could afford it, I would have like 50, 50 kids. Yeah. Or say, I want to have 10 people kids. People aren't having kids because they can't afford it. Yeah. That's why. And, and pe people get angry at me because of climate change reasons. They're oh, like, gosh. oh, people like you are the problem if you want to have to. I'm like, I haven't even personally, I haven't even had these kids yet. Yeah, they're theoretical. <laughs> it's like, My theoretical <laughs> joke children really have a serious carbon footprint yeah, we need to deal are getting, with. getting triggered. Your theoretical about, carbon so, footprint. I'm being selfish and this and that. And ah. I'm just like, this is amazing. I know. And the trickster in me cannot help it. Nah, it's, it's so... Fun. 
It's funny because I always say, I'm like, you you guys think that they didn't think during the Black Plague <laughs> when one out of four people around them was dying that the world wasn't ending? I mean, here, Dan Carl, I have Dan Carlin's The Galleys, The End is Always Near. He does hardcore history. Okay, yeah, He yeah. has a book coming out and it's all about like the apocalyptic moments that have happened where civilizations do crash because sometimes we do, mm -hmm. which whatever, it happens. Happened to the dinosaurs and they were around a lot longer than we were. And also just kind of the human obsession with like the end always being near. Yeah. And fear is a very powerful emotion. Fear drives everything. I do have like an apocalyptic sensibility though. Yeah. I, I joke about it a lot on stage. I do every time Maggie and I do a check in on the podcast, once we get to the apocalypse and we start talking about some way that, you know, zombies or whatever, when we're mm. joking about prepping, because I have this kind of prepper <laughs> nature, um, I'm like, OK, well, it's time to wrap it up. We've gotten to the end of the check in when we're talking about the 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 end being near. Yeah. But I think that scaring, you know, I have young nephews and I, it's it would be I grew up with a lot of this uh, fear mongering. Yeah. And 20, I'm 40. So 20 years ago, they were telling us that we had mm -hmm. 12 years. Acid rain. Was yeah, gonna yeah. We were going to go into an ice age mm -hmm. when I was growing up. And then it turned into too hot. Mm -hmm. And there's always been this. Yeah. And they I don't know. It's they like an the terminology. They changed the terminology. First, it was going to be there's going to be an ice age. And then it was like, oh, that's not going the right way. So now it's global warming. Ooh, that's not going there. Okay, climate change is all encapsulated. So yeah. whether, whether it gets colder or warmer <laughs> or it rains more or less, like we've got it covered. Yeah, you're right. It is a little bit more of a, it's a bigger umbrella. It's a, it's a catch all, <laughs> right? And you're going you're gonna to have people being triggered right now. Like, oh, they're denying climate change. I was like, there's, it's there's, no, not. there's no denial here. <laughs> this is pointing out just the way people behave and the way people respond to things and the way people get so... I mean, it's not hard to stir people. That's something about human beings, right? And you've seen it all throughout history. You see it globally is that it's surprisingly easy to instill fear in people and to use that fear to manipulate them, especially in groups yeah. and to just work people up into various frenzies yeah. and crazes. It could, it could be over anything. How right? do we do this? Yeah. A, co a, co <laughs> a couple of years ago, it was like, oh my gosh, there's this huge rise in there's a rape epidemic right right there's a rape culture right in the u in the u.s like all, all, all these men like there's a what were they saying there's a one in four chance uh if you're if you, you're of uh a woman in college be being raped yeah and yeah it's like if i had a daughter and the chances of her being raped were 25 percent. yeah you think i'm sending her to university yeah oh my gosh no way that's like that's like the Congo or something. Yeah. Like that. No, really, that, that's like a war zone. Yeah, that's like a, statistics. an actual. And I'm just like, no, like doing this crazy stuff. And it's like every couple of years, there's something, there's a new thing mm -hmm. that it's like, okay, this is the thing mm -hmm. now. I remember in the 90s, there was a time when it was all based on entertainment, rap music and heavy music. Oh, yeah. Where heavy metal is destroying. It's turning kids into Satanists. Destroying Satanist. the children. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's destroying the <laughs> rap children. Rap music is turning everyone into misogynists, yeah, white and, beaters. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's just. <laughs> It is like just these more, I guess what they call the moral panics. Yeah. Yeah. Moral panics. And it's just like, okay, this I, thing is the I next. wonder, so I've been contemplating, do, is there a moral panic void that always must be filled? Because Possibly. it was very, when I was growing up in America, it was very much coming from the conservative side. Mm -mm. And it was all about, I mean, they freaked out because a woman in one of our um, sitcoms, Murphy Brown, was a single mom. This okay, was yeah. like, they had an absolute meltdown because they felt like this was now, you know, going to destroy our culture representing single moms. Yeah. And that's, and that was hilarious. And, and Madonna, I mean, mm -hmm. I remember her doing that, le um, like a prayer video and you would have thought that she sacrificed her firstborn on live television. Yeah. And now it feels like that moral panic is coming from the left. It is. And the right has become a, a lot more chill. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, if you're if you want to have fun, then you can't really be you certainly can't be on the woke side of the left because comedy, They're humor, humorous. having any kind of fun, any kind of banter, saying any kind of thing you want is just off limits. There's always so going to be somebody there trying to be offended right? that's the yeah. thing you've got these people now who are trying like you're <laughs> trying to be offended it's then it's the weirdest thing I, you'll be having a conversation with someone and they'll be there oh that word you just said or oh, oh what you just said and i'm like stop 
Yeah. You know, I'm someone who I self censor myself a lot. Like I don't even I don't cuss. I don't use profanity. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff I don't say just on my own personal basis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is part of why I find it hilarious that some people consider me like, you know, controversial rapper Zuby. And I'm like, I'm like as controversial as controversial as Will Smith. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. But yeah, you're right. You're right. It's coming. It's switched from the 90s to now. It's kind of gone. The pendulum. Yeah, the yeah. pendulum swung. It's, swung. it's come. The people who aren't allowed to tell jokes or have fun or be subversive in any way, shape or form, that's gone from being the kind of somewhat religious right to the woke pronoun left. left. Well, it's the religion thing. And that's yeah. uh, the other thing that I was thinking about is, is this question I have of religion in the sense is that also something that is just wired yes. into us? You yes. know, so we'll, we'll fill that void even if it's a non secular, even if it's a secular, um, even if it's wokeism, mm -hmm. it's still that urge to have some kind of moral structure. Yep. And then I don't know, does it always come with being humorless? Like, why does that also seem to? that that's where the moral panic usually comes from. Yeah, I think it comes from I think it's there there's a lot to lot to cover there. So in terms of the the religious aspect, I certainly think that's true. I believe all human beings have kind of what I'd call a religious core. Mm -hmm. So a desire to believe in something, um questioning the meaning of life mm -hmm. and what what your purpose is and what role you're supposed to fulfill, having some concept of original sin, some concept of evil perhaps some concept of salvation, which is something the woke left is really missing. I know, I hate that's, those. That's the the that path to redemption is that, so yeah, there's, important there, to there's, me. There's no salvation there. Mm -hmm. uh, community, having certain, you know, even rituals. I mean, even when you when you see them in the street, like chanting, um, all that. I'm like, this is very religious, yeah. like fana fanatical, re re religious kind of thing. So, it's like the Inquisition. Yeah, so yeah. I, I certainly think that that's a part of it. And then coming to, I'm just trying to track my thoughts here. What was the what was the next part that you just so touched just on there? Was I was saying that, then does the moral panic always kind of come out of this sense of having a mm -hmm. religious or moral framework? Yeah, well, I think it's a couple of things. A part of it, I think, is this can be anybody. This doesn't need to be a religious thing, but people who take themselves too seriously. Mm -hmm. OK, so I've got my religious views I believe in God. I'm a firm believer in, you know, Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and all that traditional Christian. But I'm I don't take myself so seriously mm -hmm. that anybody questioning or criticizing or making a joke about what I believe in make offends me. Mm -hmm. It cracks me up. Yeah. Right. If I'm watching, I don't know, Ricky Gervais, who's like a you know atheist. super atheist. Or he's whatever, a religious he's, atheist. Yeah. And he <laughs> and, you know, he he makes some funny joke about noah's ark and how they fit all the animals you know like i find stuff like that yeah. really funny or you're making a joke about um adam and eve in the garden it's funny to me because mm -hmm. i don't take myself so seriously mm -hmm. i'm not so i don't have my entire identity and everything in my life baked into this one aspect of what i believe it's mm -hmm. what i believe it's it's an idea it's open to criticism mm -hmm. you have to accept that just like i can criticize other people's ideas and beliefs or lack of belief or whatever that's just part of being a mature adult. Mm -hmm. So it's people who just don't take themselves, but yeah, people taking themselves too seriously. And then also an arrogance. Mm -hmm. So I often tell people, like, and I get a lot of people asking, what are your belief, religious beliefs? What do you believe in God? Why do you believe in God? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, look, this is what I believe. This is why I believe it. This is my personal faith. But I have the humility to accept that I could be wrong. Right. Right. I know I could be wrong. Right. I'm like, this is what I believe. This is my faith. When someone's, oh, you can't prove, you know, you've got people who want you to, prove God exists in some mathematical formula. Like, that's not how, it's not what religion is. I mm -hmm. can't give you some rigorous proof like I could in physics mm -hmm. of what I believe in. That's mm -hmm. not, if you if you think that's what it is, you're kind of just missing, missing I the mean, whole point. I mean, that's not what faith is. No, that's not what faith is. At like, all. You, no. You, you, faith you, is believing that which you can't really see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm like that. And then I'm also just like, you know what? I could be wrong. Right. I'm going to live my, this is what I believe. I'm going to live my life this way. I'm not going to step on your toes in living my life the way I live it. You're not going to demand that everyone else. No, live I'm not going to. I'm not going to demand that everybody else converts or dies. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's like laissez faire. Like you believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. We can live our lives. Hopefully we'll all live them in a way that doesn't hurt one another, which is ultimately probably the most important thing. 
And again, yeah, I'm humble. I'm humble enough to be like, I could be wrong. I'm not going to stand here and be like, I absolutely know 100 percent, you know, with full conviction that everything I believe is correct. Because right. nobody, nobody can do that. Yeah. Like, nobody can do that. And people don't want to accept that. Yeah. That's, that's what I, that's the ones I always find weird. And I, I mean, you get this with even like some militant atheists. Yeah. When they're so, I often joke with that and it, it annoys people because I'll be like, dude, you're more religious than I am. Yeah. Because I'm like, look, I'm telling you, this is, this is what I believe. Yeah. And I'm like, look, I could be wrong. But yeah. you're like, no, like they're telling me, no, Zuby, you absolutely yeah. are wrong. You're all wrong. Billions of you, all of you are wrong. I and know. All of it is stupid. And you're all just idiots. deluded and yeah. idiots. And I'm like, that's pretty arrogant. Yeah. Like, I'm a pretty smart guy. <laughs> but and like, my, a, my like, issue with athe- the religion of atheism <laughs> is that, and I often think this is where they kind of fail in whatever their mission is to convert people is uh, is that I'm not in the business of pulling and I went through an atheist phase mm-hmm. I'm not in the business of like pulling the raft out from under people no. and I was saying this to some of my atheist friends I'm like you know why everyone hates you <laughs> because you pull out the raft under from under people and then you don't offer anything to replace it you're yeah. like hey you know that thing you're clinging to in this shit show called humanity <laughs> I'm going to take that from you, tell you it's bullshit, <laughs> and good luck. I'm not even going to give you like a little raft or even a floaty device to yeah. help you. You're just going to have to sink or swim. You know, like, yeah. I, I just think that if you're going to do that to people and tell them you're absolutely wrong in your belief, offer them something to at least help them and cling to you're taking away you're trying you're questioning the thing that people are using to like get through a day yeah uh in a, in a lot of instances yeah and ultimately i mean it matters what people do with their beliefs i'm someone who cares a lot more about i care a lot more about actions yeah than words and thoughts yeah so if if the problem is if you've got someone who is um if someone is religious and they're going out and they're committing murder because they're claiming that god is telling them to go and kill the non-believers or yeah. kill people or what that's a problem right okay but firstly you don't need religion to do that mm-hmm. right you've got people who do evil stuff and it can be done in the name of any ado- ideology or no or ideology none. and we and Just we've got cause. plenty of yeah examples of that if you look in the 20th century the biggest atrocities were not religious yeah they were secular yeah secular religions yeah it was nazism it was yep. stalinism it was communism yep. And it was people who believed in this stuff so hardcore that, okay, we're going to mass murder people in the name of some greater good. Yes. Okay. People have also done that with religion. The greater good always terrifies me. Exactly. Right. (laughs) Exactly. So the idea to me is whatever someone believes, it's just like, look, are you a decent person and do you behave in a decent way? Are you going around and hurting people and stealing from them and raping and killing and pillaging? If you are, we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. If you're not what you believe in you know it can be a fun intellectual exercise to sit there and go hmm does god exist or not oh how did we get on this huge spinning rock you know how this all these answers which we maybe one day we can totally answer but thus far doesn't seem anyone can completely you know we we know little bits and pieces yeah uh, but there's still a lot of questions out there but ultimately it doesn't matter like you know it's it's intellectual it's interesting But in terms of day to day, in terms of how we get go on in the future, it doesn't it doesn't matter, you know. No, it matters what we do. It matters what we do. Yeah, exactly. And you've got you've got wonderful religious people. You've got terrible religious people. Oh yeah, wonderful atheists. You've got terrible atheists. So it's just like, you know, just be a good person. Yeah, that that's always where I come down on is are you uh, and I always did is like are you a jerk or are you a nice person. (laughs) Because I don't really, if you, you people do a lot of messed up things in the name of their beliefs. Mm. And I, also, I think that <coughs> the idea that, you know, what you said, I don't really care about your beliefs or your thoughts. It's weird. N- some of the more pressing things that I tr- I pretty much hover above, not above like looking down on, but try to float above a lot of the politics and nonsense with a somewhat hilarious view of it all because it is amusing but then there are certain things that i find chilling and particularly the thought crime i mean it's really pervasive in the uk Mm -hmm. and as somebody who's an addict in recovery 
there's a lot of talk that goes around, you know, you'll call your sponsor or whatever if you're in a 12, in my instance, in a 12 step program. And it's like, okay, yeah, I thought about drinking. That doesn't mean that I have to or that I did. And so you learn very clearly that there's a difference between a very stark difference between thinking about doing or saying or any like having that thought and acting on that thought. A lot of addicts have impulse control. So there's a lot of attention that goes into creating space between your thoughts and your words or your thoughts and your actions. Mm -hmm. And that space needs to exist. Yeah. You need to be able to have those crazy fucked up thoughts and not be punished for even having them or even necessarily voicing them. Yeah, well, because if you're not acting on them, that's really the important the important thing. Yeah. And it's it's hard to it's hard to think and formulate thoughts without speaking them. Right. Because you need to be able to articulate stuff to, you know, work out what you think. If we're having a conversation right now, we're both thinking as we're talking. Mm-hmm. And if I say something that's like totally ridiculous or doesn't make sense or has a huge blind spot, you're there to go, oh, well, what about that? Or, oh, mm-hmm. that doesn't make sense because mm-hmm. of that. Or, you know, you can question it. And you can't, you can do it by yourself to a degree, but it's a lot more helpful to, have a discussion with another yeah. human being and you can bounce ideas off and you help to form each other's thoughts and by shutting down that discussion and that conversation you're kind of reducing people's ability to even think about their positions clearly <laughs> this is something where it can actually i mean on the extreme end it can actually lead to further radicalization i, I think we're seeing because that. you don't you're not be having a chance to nip certain thoughts in the bud or Mm -hmm. if someone is saying if someone has some i don't know really weird fringe thought or whatever and they they can't voice it or it it can't it can't be said maybe and people are trying to you know silence them and shut them down they may think "Mm, maybe i've got something here if people are so it's a little bit like when people get deplatformed yeah on social media it makes me more curious about their ideas i know i'm like hmm maybe alex jones did have some stuff to say i know i was I never followed that guy before. <laughs> like, yeah. Like I, I was, I was, I was like, okay, he's just doing his thing there. And then like all that happened, I was like, mm, man, he must have, for them to take him out in such a coordinated way. I know. Without having like a really specific reason for it. Maybe he like knew some stuff about these corporations and stuff that we should be listening to. You know, you know what I mean? It's it make, strange. Yeah. It, it, well, it, it gives them more. That. What's interesting too. And I've been thinking a lot about this is that the, the left after the election of Trump, they were all very, for one moment, self-reflective, like, oh, our bubble. Mm. This is because we live in these liberal bubbles. We need to look at these bubbles. And then over the course of these three years, it's become everyone who disagrees with us is a Nazi. Don't talk to anybody from the other side. If you do, it's guilt by association. So in effect, they've just solidified that bubble to be this impermeable jar now Mm -hmm. and um i was like guys this isn't helping your bubble (laughs) calling everyone who's like to the right of bernie a nazi is only making your bubble more bubbly Mm -hmm. it's it's part of why i hope trump wins again i'm not from the u.s yeah i'm not here but i'm like look they didn't learn their lesson last time clearly let let, let him win again give him another four years and maybe maybe they all reflect and change tack Slightly. Um, it, it's truly amazing just the total lack of self-awareness I mean, that I've been witnessing. I mean, I, I'm in the UK most of the time, so yeah. I, I'm looking from a distance. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, why can I see? I feel like I can see quite clearly what's going on. And a lot of these people just can't. And I'm like, just take a step back and it's look weird. at what you're doing and listen to what you're saying. You're talking about Trump being divisive. You're talking about him uh using certain rhetoric you have you seen what you're saying yeah have you seen what you're saying you're you're there calling black people white supremacists yeah and labeling this person that and calling that group this and you're there saying that trump is divisive how can you not see your hypocrisy because i think with cognitive dissonance Mm. when it was such a shocking reality for him to win in their world Mm. And I, I really think when you're faced with that, most people tend to either self-reflect, mm-hmm. 
which is the healthy thing to do. Why is this reality so different from the reality that I am believe? Why mm-hmm. is it, why am why is my reality being challenged? Mm-hmm. Or double down. And yeah. I think unfortunately they've done studies scientifically when your worldview is being challenged mm-hmm. so dramatically, your body actually reacts like you're being attacked. Yeah. And I think it's normal to try and it, it's crazy to me because I've seen the same thing and I've been the girl who was a liberal, like a liberal my whole life. Mm. And I'm looking at the my former party, which is increasingly becoming more and more unrecognizable. And also I'm like the canary in the coal mine screaming, you're pushing people away and they will not hear it. Yeah. It's yeah, just it's, it's like, been, oh, you were always a conservative and a racist, <laughs> obviously. It's, it's, it's been really fascinating for me because I'm someone whose political views have not changed very much throughout my life. <laughs> no. So I've kind of always been, I don't really like to label myself politically, but I've always been somewhere center right. Yeah. Okay. Were and, you raised Christian? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't raised in, you know, my, my parents, my family were not politically, particularly political right you know we've got certain traditions and cultural aspects and belief systems i guess which kind of run just generally a little more conservative Mm -hmm. but yeah i don't i don't even myself i don't consider myself someone who's hugely political where's your mom from both my parents nigerian okay yeah both my parents are nigerian and so as someone who's like there are certain aspects of i don't like to use the terms the left and the right yeah i I don't plays into the divide a little more you have to but if we're using that terminology there are a lot of things mm-hmm. I've observed amongst the left mm-hmm. for literally like 10 to 15 years, mm-hmm. which people just never understood or seemed blind to, right? I'd have, I'd have particular criticisms or things. So for example, if I used to talk about left-wing racism right. or people you know, on that side being racist in certain ways, not, not everybody, but the, like- No, I know the, what you mean. People would be like, no, racism is right wing. Like the whole concept of racism right. is right. And I'm like, no, mm. you're completely missing a whole side of this thing. I think now in 2019, when I say that, people know what I'm talking about. Right. Right. The even even liberal people. Yeah people, yeah. people now know what I mean when I say that. And I'm mm-hmm. talking about the identity politics, soft bigotry of low expectations, mm-hmm. this whole idea of, mm-hmm. you know, treating certain groups differently and whatever so I, I i've seen that for a very long time mm-hmm. with everything from affirmative action to like i've always been opposed to affirmative action even as a kid i was like i remember the first time i heard about it and i was like oh that's racist yeah i was like why would you give me better like, I, someone who went to oxford i wouldn't have wanted to like imagine how i'd feel if i knew i got into oxford because this I was is black. how i feel about like, diversity uh, hires yeah right I'd wouldn't be, I'd you be always like, wonder if you were I would rather just compete in the marketplace of ideas. I th- This is how I always felt about female scholarships and yeah, stuff. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want one just because I'm, I want to be able to intellectually mm-hmm. compete with everyone. Yeah, and when they literally lower lower the grades required. And I don't want to wonder for, if that's why. For certain why. groups, yeah. It's like, oh, we want more women in, let's, you know, let's reduce the test score that this group needs. I'm like, that is the most sexist thing. Yeah. I've <laughs> I see stuff like that and I'm like, that is actually, yeah, that's actually sexist, like mm-hmm. directly sexist. Mm-hmm. You're saying, you're telling women, you're telling young women, you know what? You're not actually, you're not actually good enough to meet the standard. <laughs> but it's literally what so you're doing. So we'll lower the so standard. So we're going to just lower the standard. Yeah. And we're not going to, you know, try to I push you I would feel to, horrible. Yeah, that's the thing. And I, I've, I've seen this for such a long time and I, I've felt like I, I'm now feeling some kind of, what's, what's the word? Almost like some kind of redemption, isn't like okay. I was I wasn't just totally yeah off validation. my rocker with some yeah, yeah validation. I wasn't totally off my rocker with some of these things because I've yep. been seeing it for so long. And then 2016, big shift, rip in the matrix. Yeah, and a lot of people are just more like, oh, okay. There are certain things that I wasn't seeing here before, or maybe maybe just wasn't privy to, or whatever you know. Because I think regardless of someone's political viewpoint, this is why actually having both sides of the political divide, shall we say, is for a normal functioning government and country, it's actually important. It is. Because one side can generally see the other side's blind spots. Right. Okay. So I would say the conservative blind spot tends to be not seeing particular issues that may exist within a system. And sometimes the boundaries might be too tight. Okay, because conservatives like borders, right? 
generally, right. both, both physically right. and metaphorically. Conservatives like borders, boundaries, and hierarchies, right. structure. Mm-hmm. Okay, whereas liberals tend to be just more more open with that. Right. Which is partly why most creative people, actors, musicians, etc., artists tend to run liberal because right. you don't really want those boundaries if you're creating art, and that plays into their politics. The liberal blind spot can be thinking that almost everything and every problem is to do with the system right. or the institutions and not looking enough at individual personal responsibility, mm-hmm. right? So a hardcore conservative might think everything's down to personal responsibility. There's nothing wrong with the system. It's all personal responsibility. Super hardcore liberal or hardcore leftist might think, no, er- the whole problem, if we can just fix the, f- right. fix the system, fix the system, it's capitalism, we overthrow capitalism. We need to tear down this hierarchy. We need to do this. We need to... And the reality is, you know what? Sometimes the boundaries are in the wrong place and you need to expand those boundaries because you've got certain people being excluded. You've right. got certain rules, policies, whatever, that are not being applied equally and fairly. And that's where I would say sort of like good liberalism comes in and is necessary. It's totally. Like, okay, wait, why, why can't women vote? Why, right. can, why, can't, why can't black people do that? Why or can't like, they do like, Yeah, I like, think there needs to be like loans for houses for the black population yeah, this, is a problem that be, we definitely need to address. Yeah, this needs to be addressed. This, this needs to be needs to be leveled out and mm-hmm. whatever so each side can and, and you need to keep having that dialogue so that it's like okay cool let's get the rules and the boundaries and the regulations and whatever in the right place but you don't want to just go off the edge oh. where it's like oh you know what men and women don't even exist anymore <laughs> we don't need those boundaries we don't you know oh men can use women's changing rooms compete in sport that and you're, you're this is what we're seeing right now yeah it's like you're just trying to erase all boundaries erase all structures mm. just just tear down the whole thing Sanarchy. and this this is yeah this is the time when you need sane people to mm. be like oh no hang on those borders are there for a reason mm-hmm. right you're not putting those those borders aren't there in sport and in changing rooms and in women's crisis centers to be mean to people right and to exclude people out of some kind of bigotry or hatred it's for safety and security, right. et cetera. You're seeing the same with the actual border. <laughs> that when is got, where I'm like, when, I when don't got... want to compete with someone who's male <laughs> is in athletics. Yeah. <laughs> that I, or, is an area where I'm like, okay, yeah. have girl stuff. Yeah, no, you don't. Uh, or, or when you're talking actual borders, yeah. like literally physical country borders. Yeah. And you've got people saying, oh, we should just have open borders, let everybody in. And you need people to be like, wait, no, like that's a bad idea because x y and z you want to know who's coming in you want to have a level of security a level of control whatever like to to someone very conservative more conservative minded that's really really obvious Mm -hmm. but then if you go too far that end you'll have the people who are just like oh we just want to close the borders completely no immigration Mm -hmm. no and again you're like no that's not the right that's not the right boundary because Mm -hmm. actually you want a level of immigration and you want to be bringing good productive people into a country to make it better and give people opportunities, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So like I said, you, you want to constantly be having that conversation. This is what I think is the biggest issue with political polarization is that that conversation shuts down and people are just kind of throwing stones at each other instead of saying, okay, what's the right, for each of these issues, what's the right policy? What are the right boundaries? How do you How think do you break right? through? I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Is your stepsister super woke? Do you need a mug that reminds you of your favorite person on Twitter? (laughs) Go to (laughs) BridgetFetacy.com and use promo code WALKIN for all of (laughs) Fetacy's amazing merch. T-shirts, tote bags, mugs. Here's my testimonial. (laughs) I wear my fantasy hoodie every day, and that is not a lie. I love my fantasy champion hoodie. It's, it's true. So- she won't even take it off to wash it. No, I, I seriously have it in my car at all times. It's been so cold here in California. <laughs> California cold is no joke. I've been freezing my butt off, and Fetacy's, Fetacy Inc. has kept me warm. Warming my hands by the dumpster fire on YouTube while I wear my Fetacy Inc. Hoodie and beanie. So go to BridgetFetacy.com and use promo code WALKIN for 15% off your next Fetacy merch purchase. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most important deal of your lifetime. <laughs> Fetacy's sponsoring Walkin' Woods Welcome now. It's a closed loop. 
<laughs> it's full fantasy loop. <laughs> and now back to your regular scheduled programming. More fantasy content. This content has been produced by Fantasy Inc., which is sponsoring this content, which also is giving you a discount on our merch. <laughs> How do you, you know, and and I feel like you and I occupy very similar space in Mm. the ecosystem and that, okay, people are like, yay, finally, someone with common sense is talking. This is what I hear all the time. I see you hearing this a lot. Mm -hmm. We make fun of it. Don't take things too seriously, particularly ourselves. Take things seriously like free speech when it's necessary Mm -hmm. or due process or scientific method that I feel are gifts of the enlightenment that we could easily lose that humanity has not always had. Mm. Now, how do you feel we help sow that kind of tear in the in the polarized? Like it's almost like there's been this tear in the fabric of mm. society and you you're starting to see like the the breakdown a little bit. Mm-hmm. And how what do you think what do we do? Zuby, what do we do? What do we do? I think we keep doing what 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 we're we're both already doing. You keep the conversation going. You keep the discussion channels open. You don't worry about being labeled this or that Mm -hmm. or not being allowed to talk to this person or not being allowed to talk to that person. You don't play by their rules Mm -hmm. because you're going to just keep having people trying to police you, censor you, shut you down, cancel you, whatever. Mm -hmm. You've got to just keep talking Mm -hmm. and keep airing the opinions. And people are... You know, people do get fatigued by the nonsense. Yeah. And when people get fatigued by nonsense, they are looking for sensible voices. You're, yeah. You're seeing that. There's a reason why long form podcasts are becoming more popular. There's yep. a reason why, you know, Joe Rogan and Dave Rubin and other people are, you know, us. There's a reason why we're able to do what we do and people are actually interested. No, it's because we're grifters. <laughs> do you hear that a lot? Of course I do. I'm of course. A, of course I do. I'm a black le- conservative leaning guy. Oh yeah, um, I bet you get it all oh, the gosh, time. Yeah, I, I, that's the that's the best though because I get as, it all the time. Especially especially as a musician, I love the idea that there's like all this money. Yeah, being like a <laughs> being like an openly right leaning rapper. Yeah, and like that's where all the money like, is. I'm and like <laughs> Christian rock rapper, guys. <laughs> like I couldn't just make more money by peddling some woke nonsense. That's what I said yesterday and on just, Twitter. <laughs> I was like, guys, if I was a grifter, I'd be writing shit about how my white privilege is affecting, like, you know, my daily experience. And I would be making jokes on late night television about how Orange Man bad and I would be killing it. I'd be in a writer's room. I'd be rich right now. I know. it's, It's amazing. It's truly amazing how like, yeah, I mean, you've just got all these celebrities or public figures who just have their their handlers no, sometimes not even themselves right their, their managers or whatever just giving them this little script to stand up and run and talk about the sort of woke points of the day the woke and, points yeah <laughs> like you know people are there cheering and whatever and they'll never be called a grifter or a sellout or anything and then you'll have someone who actually puts something on the line yeah like, i don't know kanye west yeah who's actually you know i'm gonna i'm what I believe goes against the grain here. Yeah. But I'm Kanye, so I'm going to I'm going to say it anyway, you know, consequences be damned. I'm going to wear this red hat. I'm going to yeah. just say what I want to say. And all of a sudden, I mean that that's like a career risk. Yeah. He doesn't need to do that. That's 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 going to hurt him potentially more than it'll benefit him. Um and that goes for a lot of people. So when someone like that is called some name like a grifter, I'm like yeah, but you know what? I think a lot of people don't actually know what words mean anymore. No, yeah, well, people they don't just, have any meaning people anymore. People just say stuff. People just talk because they have a mouth. Yeah, they just say things, and I'm like, do you even know what that? Do you know what that? What you just said? Do you know what it means? Yeah. If you're gonna call me a fascist, do you actually know what the meaning of that word? Yeah. Like, I'm a pretty libertarian person, so yeah. I'm like the opposite of a fascist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, don't get, you can't get a libertarian fascist because it's complete opposite. Yeah. Right. And people just say things. It's like, oh, it sounded convenient. No, it's fascist. Fascist. It's like, what are you even saying? Yeah. Oh, that person's a white. Like, do you know what white supremacy actually means? Yeah. Like that, that that term has a meaning. It's a real thing. Yeah. It has a meaning. And then you've you've got people saying, you know, calling brown and black people. I'm like, that doesn't exist. Yeah. You don't get. You know, you'll you'll have. I saw some article and it was titled something like the the rise of the rise of multi ethnic white supremacy. Yeah. I was like. What? <laughs> like, like, who, who wrote? Who wrote this? Fire them! Like, wh- yeah. what, are you, what are you even talking about? Right? Like, so th- weird. Th- like that's not a thing. 
right? And then they'll start saying, oh, white supremacy doesn't mean this. It now means it's like, it's like racism. To, yeah. When people try to redefine these terms, it's like, oh, you thought it meant this. It actually means I'm like, no, it actually means what the original definition. Yeah. Was. Racism now means change what you want. Now it's like a, it has a new definition. It's power, yeah. power, essentially. Yeah. Pa- yeah um, Race plus power. Yeah. Prejudice plus power. P- prejudice plus prejudice power. Plus, plus plus institutional power. Right. Not even individual power. So you could be an extremely powerful black man or an extremely powerful black woman, but you still can't be racist because you don't have the institutional privilege. Right. So, and you could be an extremely you, dirt poor white person with no teeth and the matter. Frickin', yeah. It doesn't matter. And, like the middle of nowhere America suck, suck and you have yeah and you're the <laughs> it's truly amazing to me that, that this is partly why I find this stuff so totally bonkers and ridiculous it's we right? are I'll, living in a South Park episode yeah like, it's I'll, like you can't even write it yeah like I'll be walking around certain places and cities in the UK in the USA and I'm like man a lot of these like you know vast majority of these homeless people or drug addicts or whatever vast majority from a white men yeah okay this is the apex fallacy because you'll have people talking about if you want you'll ask for an example of okay what do you mean by male privilege or white privilege and someone say oh 90 92 percent of fortune 500 ceos are white male i don't know the stat but they'll say something like that and i'm like okay well what about what about okay you're looking at the top here you're looking at the apex what about the bottom yeah like what percentage of those are white dudes and it's like oh okay that might be like 80 percent yeah <laughs> and it's like okay so doesn't why are you focusing on this one and on that one? And why are, why are you even making it a race thing to begin with? Because right. that oftentimes race is a pretty irrelevant factor mm. in most things. Sometimes it's important. It is. Sometimes it's important, but oftentimes it's just not the primary factor of anything, right? More likely it'll be socioeconomic. It could be based on intelligence. It could be based on people's, you know, how they were raised and their family situation and mm-hmm. their parents. you know there, there are so many factors and i guess as human beings we like to have simple answers to things and it's a lot easier for Labels. people yeah it's a lot easier for people if they can just say it's that thing yeah you know there aren't that many things where it's just one thing <laughs> you know you know what i mean yeah. like there aren't that many people who it's just oh you're, you're just that one thing. yeah you're, you're but, just you're just a white woman yeah that, that's it or just black man it's like okay that tells you nothing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that tells you how much melanin i have in my genitalia yeah that's literally all it tells but you you're not even a man doesn't tell you well i am right now <laughs> i currently i i'm gender fluid so yeah. what is it like you were saying this earlier that you were talking at the ayn rand center um what is it like to be a man in 2019 it's pretty fun yeah my life is pretty good yeah <laughs> it's, it's pretty good i can't speak for everybody I can only ever speak for Zuby. Yeah. But um, yeah, thing, things are pretty good. I haven't been impressed recently. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't throw a milkshake on you or anything? Uh, no. It's coming, Zuby. It's they, coming. No, no, get that, that. Milkshake, <laughs> that milkshaking is coming. So, somebody's going to get hurt. if they. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what do you, when you talk about this stuff, what do you tell men? You know, what, are, mm, mm. what advice do you have for men in 2019? I think it's really important. First thing, I guess, is to tell them and it's okay to be a man. Yeah. It's okay to be masculine. It's not just okay. It's good. One uh, of the funny things I see with men, and sorry to interrupt, hold your thought, is my big issue with the men who are kind of pushing back against the like kind of war on masculinity. Mm. I don't really like to call it a war, but the pushback against it is that they'll blame feminism for all their ails. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pathetic (laughs) yeah i'm like don't blame feminism for your problems that's even more ridiculous yeah you're not proving how masculine you are by blaming (laughs) feminism for all your problems guys i I have a theory that um all most of feminism is uh what you'd call an shit test Mm. just on like a sort of national scale that like western men have just failed Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah so um yeah i like I can I can get it to a degree, I guess not not feminism as a whole, because that in itself has got its own splinter groups and yeah, things, it's crazy. Like, things like that. I think when they're talking about like the new age man hating, let's demonize men, demonize boys, all men, all boys are potential rapists, et cetera, et cetera. All that kind of stuff, I think, certainly plays a problem. You know, it's it, it is it is a genuine problem. It's not it's not the whole problem, but I think certainly as a man, if you're pushing masculinity, then you need to 
you need to promote rather than I think you need to promote the virtues of masculinity rather than attack the negatives of feminism. Exactly. In, in a way. I agree. Yeah. So I think it's more because like, it looks reactive. Exactly. It's very it's very reactionary and it looks kind of weak. Yeah. It looks kind of weak. It's like, look, if you're promoting masculinity and being like, look, we're all conquering. We're all conquering men. We're warriors. We're fighters. We're providers. We're protectors. Then you maybe know, don't a, attack women. A silly. Fe- <laughs> yeah, I don't think feminism and women are that correlated. <laughs> In a way, as in, I don't think feminists. I know feminists claim to speak for women, but I often don't think that they really do. Yeah. Um, and if that were the case, then most women would have a positive view of modern feminism, yeah, which I they don't, don't believe that they no, do. No, it's like seven yeah, percent or something. Exactly. So I don't think that criticism of feminism is criticism of females at all. Yeah. I think those are those are totally different things. But yeah, I think uh, for guys, it's really about you know I'm I'm trying not to I'm trying not to sound like Jordan Peterson here and saying you know get your, your get, get your act together. But yeah, you know it. But it is true. Take take responsibility. Yeah. Whether you're a man or a woman, whoever you are, just take responsibility for your life. Realize that you can affect and control you yep. far more than you can affect and control anybody else let alone everybody else and be grateful for where you are i mean if you live in the western world if you live in the usa you live in canada you live in the uk you live in australia you're in an incredible position even if it doesn't feel like it is at the time even if you're going through some crap you are in a privileged position even if it doesn't seem like it yeah you've got a lot of opportunity you've got a chance to rise out of the hole that a lot of people around the world don't really have. For. Yeah, they don't really have it. Even if they're smart, they're intelligent, they're go-getters, just where they are, their environment just may not have any opportunity. You yep. could take that person with that attitude and drop them in the US and they'll open a business. Oh, and I know. Within a decade or two, they'll they'll be crushing it. I married a guy from not the United States mm-hmm. and it was it's amazing to see what he's done and just you know, the 15 years since he's been here. Yeah. Because he came from Belarus, which okay, is a yeah. literal dictatorship. Yeah. And so he got into a place with, he laughs. We were, we got together over the summer. We we're still good friends. And he was saying to me, um, Bridget, you've had the same president since I've been here in 2000. You know, from his perspective, it's like, what are you people fighting about? Yeah, you've matter. had the same leader. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I do not understand. what the What is your fucking problem? Yeah. And then he sees all these people who are on the, the far left with the hammer and sickle, and he's like, <laughs> what is the matter with you guys? Like, what are you fucking doing? Yeah, you guys, do you even know what communism is? It's crazy. He's like, I waited in line for toilet paper when I was a kid, and you guys are waving that flag. Yeah. He gets mad. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I don't blame him. Yeah. But this is this is what happens when you actually have perspective. Yeah. Perspective and gratitude. And if you lack those things, then yeah, life is going to be rough for you. And you're going to make life rough for just people who are around you. Yeah. I mean, I try to surround myself with people who are generally just, you know, positive and optimistic and don't see themselves as victims and all that. Cause it's just it's just tiring. Yeah. And, you know, I've I've only got so many hours in a day and I'm not gonna spend it being dragged into a hole of misery no. by other people. If someone's ready to get out of that hole of misery, I'm happy to help them in any way that I can, whether it's, you know, physical, mental, mindset, whatever. But they need to be ready for that. If you yeah. just want to be a perpetual victim and sit there and complain about how Donald Trump said something mean or how somebody disagreed with something or somebody wrote something bad in a blog, then you know, it's just like there's bigger fish to fry. There That's are bigger problems. Like I'd rather just focus on what I'm doing and what I can input out to the world yeah. and how I can make things better for myself and people around me. Yeah, that's really where the focus needs to be. So coming back to the original question, I think that's what that's what men need to do. Yeah. Um, and they need to recognize that there's nothing inherently wrong with them just by virtue of being male. I know, right. that, you know, certain this is where certain aspects of society and feminism, I think, have played a role and kind of instilling that, particularly in younger boys, mm-hmm. you know, there's this idea that there's something inherently wrong with your gender mm-hmm. just by virtue of you mm-hmm. being born a boy. That is not true. Mm-hmm. That's not true. Um, it's great to be a guy. Um, it's I'm funny. Sure, it's like the pendulum swinging. Yeah. I'm sure it's great to be a woman, too. It's great to be a human being. Yeah. Um, and it's better to be a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have a cone like yeah, Hope does right say. now. <laughs> they, and they don't get to talk either. They can't do podcasts. No, they can't. Exactly. Hope does podcasts. <laughs> She'll come in. She tries, but you know, yeah. she's she's more of a silent podcaster. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think that it's so what was your kind of up until this you're young, but what's your darkest night of the soul? You know, what's the thing you've had to really and if it's something personal you don't want to talk about, that's totally understandable. I ask no, questions like this. Of people. No, it's fine. It's actually that I'm so blessed that it's hard to think of one. Mm. It's really hard to think of one. I haven't had a period in my life that was just really dark. I'm I'm ex- I'm an extreme optimist. That's good. I'm an extreme optimist, and I, it's it's my personality is just wired that way. Yeah, and I'm not very. What's I'm not, the I'm biggest very challenge? To, okay, biggest challenge. I would say that. Um, the biggest challenge for me is trying to fulfill my potential. Mm. It's my biggest driver, but it's my biggest mm-hmm. challenge. I'm someone mm-hmm. who's, um, maybe I have some kind of delusions of grandeur. I'm right there with right? you. Right, but I'm someone who wants to really make a dent and an impact in the world. It's why I became a musician. It's why I left my corporate job and took a huge pay hit to run around promoting my CDs. and So, so you did have a corporate stuff. job? Yeah, I used to be a management consultant for oh, three years. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. and um, I left that to go become a full-time musician. Okay. So That's um, a big risk. Yeah, it's a big risk, but I wouldn't be here literally right now. Mm-hmm. If, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done Rogan yesterday if, mm-hmm. I, if I hadn't have done that. So I just knew that I cannot have an impact on millions of people doing what I was doing. I can have a nice bank account. I can have a nice car. I can, you know, have nice things and feed my, feed a future family or whatever. But I can't impact the world in the way that I know that I want to, and the way that I actually genuinely know that I'm capable of doing, which mm-hmm. is what I'm literally right now trying to do. I don't yet know exactly what the picture looks like, but it seems to be materializing slowly but surely through these conversations and Mm -hmm. through the impact of what I'm doing online and my music and my podcast and the book and all these different things. I ultimately want to just have this impact on tens, you know, man, if I can reach hundreds of millions of people one day and I can die and I can rest in my grave and know that I've had some kind of positive impact on a whole ton of people, then I'll be really happy. So my, my biggest fear and my biggest concern is when I feel like I'm not moving towards that goal or I start to occasionally doubt myself and think, oh gosh, man, are you trying to take on, are you trying to bite off more than you can chew here? Are you really built for this? Are you talented enough? Are you capable enough? All that kind of stuff. And I've had certain periods, particularly um, early on when I started doing my music career full time, where I would just be somewhere and I'm like, dude, what am I doing? Why did I give up? You know, like that's, oh. that steady paycheck to do this i mean specifically here's a here's a good answer for your question actually there was one time i was up in um this would have been around so i I started doing my music full-time 2011 there was one time i think in 2012 and i was in glasgow in scotland i think it was november (laughs) it was snowing it was a tuesday and i was just standing on the high street like with my backpack full of cds (laughs) Talking to strangers, selling my CDs. I've had these moments. I know and exactly I was like, this feeling so And well. I was literally like, this time last year, I was in my suit uh-huh. in an office in London doing a normal, respectable corporate job that had me on a certain line over the course of years for promotions and salary and whatever. And I'm now here freezing my nuts off, <laughs> talking to uninterested strangers in Glasgow. I, I live Standing on the up, out your mixtape. I live on selling slang, <laughs> and, and I'm just like, what, what am I doing? Like, what, yeah. you know, what I mean? like, like a moment like I'm, I'm in some like cheap hotel room. Like, yeah. well, I'm in Glasgow for. I'm like, what am I freaking doing mm-hmm. with my life? I like, know what? This. Why have I done this? Like, yep. this, this was by choice. <laughs> like, yeah. why, why have I done that? So what maybe did your for me that think? was. Um, my parents are extremely supportive. Oh, that's amazing. They are you an only child? No, I've got, I'm one of five. Oh, me too. Yeah, one of five. Yeah, good. Yeah. I'm Where a, are you in the order? The last one. I knew it. I would have guessed. <laughs> you have that baby of five, five. <laughs> that's why I sensed maybe only child, but no baby. Same oh, thing. Oh, gosh. Okay. No. <laughs> um, I'm the oldest. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, so you're just the babe. Yeah, yeah. So I can get away with stuff. Yeah, and I think by then, too, parents have been through enough kids and their trials and tribulations that they're like, kids are just going to happen. Yeah, they're like, you know. They're like, going like, to do their thing. Yeah, they're just like, you know, let Zuby do his thing. He's These other four are more sensible. Like, Zuby's just going to go and be Zuby. Yeah, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> so I always ask the same two questions at the end. What is your biggest defective character or vice that you work to overcome 
either daily or you've been working over the year or whatever, whatever, however that kind of res- resonates with you. It's probably the same as one of my biggest strengths, mm-hmm. which is that I'm really hard to phase and I'm not very emotional. Mm. I'm not very sensitive. I'm extremely insensitive to negative emotion. So that makes me a very, very resilient person mm-hmm. and someone who doesn't get put down easily, is very difficult to slow down or stop, or and I don't take criticism to heart very mm-hmm. much. But it can make it difficult for me to, sometimes I can be a little bit unsympathetic to people. Right. Right. And that's something that, you know, I, I, do, I do work on it. Yeah. I, I feel like I have a ton of sympathy for people who I feel are deserving of it. Right. But there's a lot of people I just don't really feel like they deserve my sympathy like we, we've been talking a lot about the victim mentality right and people like just making problems where they aren't and i don't have a lot of sympathy for that and it can be it can be a little hard for me to understand certain things so because of my personality type for example i'm very i'm kind of i don't want to say i'm immune but i'm probably quite close to immune to something like depression yeah so i don't get it i had a so i can yeah yeah i understand this i had this for a long time i did not understand i mean my <laughs> I had a friend who had um, what is it called when you sleep all the time? There's like narcolepsy. No, it's oh, the no? the other one where you sleep like all the time, and it's something oh. like a sleep disorder or something. And I was like, that's not a disorder; it's just laziness. <laughs> and I didn't really understand depression yeah, yeah. that much until I got sober. And then the first two years were very hard, and I was in a. I, I it felt like my brain was re- mm. rewiring after years of you know doing smoking weed and doing drugs and drinking and i had a new perspective on that in a in a way that's given me the ability to help be more helpful to people and i think being an addict and being in the gutter for a while Mm -hmm. just i have a better understanding of the circumstances that sometimes can influence people's lives because i definitely understand that it borders on callousness with me sometimes Yeah. yeah and and sometimes because I've picked myself up out of thing after thing after thing. You know it can be done. I know it can be done. And I have even less empathy for people who are in that victimhood mentality. And I have to remember, no, Bridget, you were there. Yeah. You were, I had years where I, it's an easy place to rest. Yeah. And I understand now when you have a culture that's actually figured out a way to monetize it mm-hmm. and there's value in victimhood. It's so much, it's even easier. Yeah. It's not like the greatest generation where I always talk about this. My grandfather is writing letters from World War II in the South Pacific and he's out being bombed every time they get underway. And he's like, but I wouldn't want anyone to feel sorry for me. Don't think that I have any self-pity. Like you're, you're a war, Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> you're allowed yeah. to have a moment of self-pity, yeah. but it's not culturally... And I was talking to Glenn Beck about this, just how whiny our culture has become. And part of the reason I started this podcast is that instead of even that kind of intellectual dark web, I feel can fall into this trap. We all can Mm. pushing back against the victimhood culture. But then we end up whining about the victimhood culture. And I just want to create something that's, you know, the uh, so what's the opposite of that grit and resilience? So let's talk, tell stories about grit and resilience Mm -hmm. and that. But I do, I do wrestle with it because it, it's uh, for me. It manifests as like junkie pride. Okay, it's like, oh, you're here, you're you're experiencing this. Like I experienced that, mm. and it's that, com- it's that same competitive. Yeah, I uh, see. I, th- I think with victimhood. Me, yeah, with me, it's more like, uh, oh, Cap- I, n- I never did that. I never fall, fell into that hole. Right, I, right. For, for me, it was super easy to not even go near that thing. Yeah. So just do the same yeah just you know? don't do it yeah just don't do it you know yeah. I'm someone who doesn't I, I don't drink alcohol I've yeah never, i've never done any drugs i've never even smoked weed and it wasn't that wasn't hard for me to do mm-hmm. some people are like oh my gosh like it takes so much willpower to not drink and i'm yeah. like Psh, like what do you mean like you know when and i and i hear about <laughs> your environment and supportive parents and then i'm like well yeah maybe if i had parents who gave a shit i wouldn't have either you know it's yeah, like yeah, that yeah. that's where i feel like i have an understanding of the the fact that the environment more compassion for matter. this story yeah it, yeah. Does yeah it does matter and it is hard though because i definitely have that like well pick yourself up by your freaking bootstraps man yeah, exactly. And it's it's hard to get the balance right. Yeah. Because then you, on the other side, you have people who are just kind of enablers. 
yeah who were just like oh you know nothing's your fault nothing's yeah. your fault oh don't worry it's not you it's the kind of people who i don't know someone will be morbidly obese and they'll be telling them oh it's it's because they put chemicals in the food yeah, no. and oh you should sue mcdonald's <laughs> because and i'm like are you insane yeah. stop eating yeah you know and then someone would be like oh zuby you're so harsh you're a fat shame i'm not fat shame no. just stop eating like yeah you know? it's true yeah. <laughs> like it's just an objective truth if you stop doing that you won't have these problems sometimes i know it's we live in such strange times like that it's it's my therapist is so good about um, because I think part of being an addict to intertwined in that is that victim mentality keeps you there. Mm. And she always says to me, even now, six years sober, you know, stop saying why I don't, I rarely say this anymore, but she had this mantra that was like drilled into me. Stop saying, why is this happening to me? And start asking, why is this happening for me? Yeah. And just that very little shift, it shifts the world happening to you as like, okay, everything that bad that has happened in my life has given me, this is where my faith comes in, has has been for my, it, it's bettered me and my ability to either help others mm -hmm. or to make myself stronger in a way that may have been a blind spot or whatever. Yeah, you know, maybe this is the religious side of me, you know, I don't believe God gives people things that they can't handle. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone has different challenges, different burdens, different, disabilities obstacles whatever the case case may be and it can certainly seem extremely unjust at times mm -hmm. but i do firmly believe that you know no matter what someone is going through they can get out of it mm -hmm. it's not like this is just a total condemnation of your life and there's you're stuck here and you're just here forever i don't i don't think that's the truth and i've seen enough people personally and sort of in the wider world who have gone from really really low places to super duper high places and becoming such inspirational oh people yeah that it makes me just think yeah that's that's the truth and in fact those those stories can be even more powerful oh totally they it's can be the, even more powerful it's yeah. the gift of i mean that's why i love recovery it's mm -hmm. like something i never thought i would love but seeing the transformation and hearing the stories of people they'll get up and speak these like kind of circuit speakers and you're like you were home you yeah. how how yeah. did you go i can't even imagine these people in that condition and now where they are today and that is that is why i think the path to redemption and leaving that open I'm, i always say to people you don't know you don't know who's gonna get get it and yeah. suddenly change their life and it can be people, I, I remember when I first went into the rooms and I there was this one guy and I was like, there's no freaking way this guy's staying sober. And now he's got like six years. We went in at the same time. He's, he's probably thinking the same thing about me. <laughs> and we're both like, you're still here? But it's like, you just don't know. And people who I thought may have gotten it didn't. It's yeah. just, we don't know. Well, good good for you. Congratulations. What's So you, your biggest thank you. Your What's your biggest asset? Same thing, resilience. Yeah, it's similar. Yeah, perseverance, mm -hmm. resilience, optimism, just being optimism, and being pretty unshakable. Yeah, and unfazable, no matter what madness comes my way or in my direction. Or you know, when I get these online mobs coming for me, I find it hilarious. I'm like, bring it. Yeah, <laughs> like, let's it's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's do this. If you're um, kind of self-employed, it's hard for them to really. Yeah, you can't cancel Zuby can't do much and anyone who's ever thought of canceling me is canceled so if i get you first you can't get me <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome well thank you so much i know you've been on this massive tour and i really appreciate you coming through here and sitting down i want everyone to follow you where can we find you i am on twitter facebook instagram and youtube same handle on everything at zuby music mm -hmm. z-u-b-y music you can check me out at zubymusic.com my podcast is real talk with zuby that's available on itunes Spotify, YouTube, all the usual places. And my latest album, Perseverance, The Best of Zuby, is also out now on all those same channels. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. We'll keep we'll keep enjoying to watch you rise and inspire those around us with your light. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Okay. Maggie is away for the check-in again. This week's been a little bit strange. What with the holiday, everything feels like it's a day late and a dollar short. But we have very exciting news at fetacy.com. 
And as was announced this morning, I am the first creator on Dave Rubin's new platform that's not really a platform, Locals, which is super exciting. I really cannot express how honored I am and grateful that Dave chose me to be the first person to represent Locals. And also just so excited about the space. It is such a cool community. It's a little bit it's a little bit like Patreon meets Twitter. So it's like my ideal online world. And it's a $5 minimum to join our community. You get all the content, no more levels. You get all of the dumpster fire outtakes. I'm creating some original locals only content. And more importantly, it feels like a community. So we're all in there. We've been kind of testing it for a couple weeks. And some of my beloved patrons have been in there testing it with me. And it's just so cool how you we have our own stream. So I can see what I just post, but I can also see what all of you are posting. And everyone's so supportive of each other. And we're talking about our New Year's goals. And people are giving each other tips and feedback and encouragement. And this is the community that I want to create and build and it keeps me independent as a creator. I'm not so reliant on sponsors and therefore not so dependent on constantly saying the the right thing or abiding by the approved message so that I don't lose sponsorship. I'm on a place where I can post video and not have it taken down because I'm not speaking the approved message. And we wanna make more video and get to a point where we have two or three dumpster fires a week and even more ideas that I want to create and more content that's scripted. So this is like my little dream come true. And fetacy.com is where it lives. You can join and please do. We're going to be doing, Maggie and I are going to be doing more regular check-ins, just um, posting them only for locals, just whatever the day's events are and some culture stuff. And I'm just so excited. And thank you, Dave Rubin. And thank you, Rubin Report and all of the people there who've been so supportive. Come on, guys. Get on in there. Join us, the Fetacy family. It's the price of a latte for a month. And you can experience all of the fun and joy and be shielded from a lot of the noise and mean nastiness that exists out in the common area. I've been joking that it's my gated community online and it does feel that way. It feels like a nice family friendly vibe and I wanna keep it that way. So really excited, go to fetacy.com. You can, the minimum's five, but if you wanna support at a higher level, I'm not gonna stop you. You can do whatever you want. That's also the cool thing. We, we are accepting any and all support. So again, thank you guys for being such great listeners. Thank you for being on this journey with me. I have even bigger plans. I really want to do a tour around America with Walk-Ins Welcome and interview a lot of our listeners, interview people all over the United States and embody the spirit of this podcast, which is that it was born in an RV in the middle of the woods and we're going to take that RV on the road and talk to you guys, but we need your support to do that. And I hope to see some of you guys on the road later in the year and hope to see a lot of you in the community. All right, betacy.com. Hope you guys are excited as I am. And Maggie, I know she's excited even though she's not here. And I'll see you guys around. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Betacy Incorporated, for their amazing support. Fantasy Incorporated is a brand that brings you laughter and joy. (laughs) (laughs) Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)